Good evening, everyone. It's time to take your seats. Welcome to tonight's evening symposium on the future of Christian higher education. I'm Cherie Harder, the tr uh, president of the Trinity Forum, and we are delighted this evening to be in partnership with Gordon College in presenting this symposium and what promises to be a fascinating conversation on both the unique value and the challenges of Christian higher education in the future. Uh, I'm delighted that each of you are here this evening. There's a lot of new faces in the audience, and if this is your first uh, evening event with the Trinity Forum, we want to give you a very special welcome and hope that you'll come back. I'd also like to just recognize a few special guests in the audience. Uh, we know that there are a number of different trustees from Gordon College who are here tonight, including Susie Young and her husband David Young, a former trustee of Gordon, Shapri Lomaglio, Santiago Sadako, and Doug Gilbert, delighted that all of you are here. We have a few public servants who have joined us this evening as well. Senator Ben Sass uh, from Nebraska, also a former Christian College president uh, at Midland College in Fremont, Nebraska. Uh, yes. <laughs> as well as John Peaty, the senior deputy chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Delighted that you can join us. We also know that there are many people who wanted to be here tonight but could not make it. So if you have friends who wanted to join but couldn't come, they can actually watch tonight's event via live stream uh, on our YouTube channel uh, or on www.ttf.org slash events. Uh, and we'll also be posting video in the next couple of days as well in addition to posting both pictures on Facebook where you can tag your friends and live tweeting on Twitter where you can follow along and add your own thoughts and comments. For those of you who aren't familiar with the Trinity Forum, we work to provide a space and resources for leaders to engage life's greatest questions in the context of faith. And we do this by providing both readings and publications, which draw upon classic works of literature that explore enduring questions and connect the timeless wisdom of the humanities with timely issues of the day, as well as participating and sponsoring programs such as this one tonight to connect leading thinkers with thinking leaders in engaging those big questions of life and ultimately coming to better know the author of the answers. With each new program, such as the one tonight, we try to take on and wrestle with one of those big questions. And it's been said that many of the big questions of life essentially boil down to just three. What is a good person? What is the good life? And what is the just society? Such questions, not coincidentally, once formed both the basis and the purpose of higher education. There was a sense that a university, as its very name suggests, united various disciplines of knowledge to help form and develop human beings to live wisely and well, to help them become a good person, and to live a good life and contribute to a just society. Or, as Wendell Berry once put it, underlying the very idea of a university is the bringing together the combining into one of all the disciplines. It's the idea that good work and good citizenship are the inevitable byproducts of the making of a good, fully developed human being. But in many universities, the theoretical unity of knowledge that Barry describes is honored only in the breach. As branches of disciplines have turned into silos with faculty incentivized to pursue ever more arcane, and specialized fields, mm -hmm. such to the point that in the name of one WAG, they know more and more about less and less until eventually they know everything about nothing. <laughs> Financial pressures have encouraged many university leaders to prioritize chasing research dollars or packing football stadiums over undergraduate teaching. The increasing fragility of the American family has led to increasing demands upon administrators to serve in loco parentis to struggling students, even as both students and parents increasingly question the financial worth of the education they're receiving. So for all the achievements, and they are legion and extraordinary, change is coming and inevitable, which leads us to the question, how can Christian edu uh, higher education adapt with the times but remain true to its mission? 
So tonight, we'll discuss the unique value that Christian higher education offers, the unique challenges it faces, and together consider what its future could and should be. And it's hard to imagine a more thoughtful panel than the one we have tonight to help us tackle just such a question. Michael Lindsay is the president of Gordon College. In the six years that since Michael has assumed the helm, Gordon has experienced banner years by just about any measure, enrollment, fundraising, research, campus diversity, faith expression, and so on. Earlier in his career, uh, Michael had served on the sociology faculty at Rice University, where he won multiple awards, both for his research, his scholarship, uh, and his teaching. He's lectured on five continents and is the author of more than two dozen scholarly publications. His work, Faith in the Halls of Power, was nominated for a nonfiction Pulitzer Prize in 2007. And his more recent book, View from the Top, won top awards and has been translated into both Chinese and Japanese. And I'm proud to say was the subject of a Trinity Forum evening conversation just next door three years ago. He earned his PhD in sociology from Princeton and graduate theological degrees from Wycliffe Hall at Oxford and Princeton Theological Seminary, as well as receiving his undergrad summa cum laude from Baylor University, where he was named Outstanding Young Alumnus. Shirley Hoekstra serves as the president of the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities, where she serves as a uh, passionate, eloquent, and articulate ambassador for Christian higher education and the role that it plays in serving the common good. She previously served for more than 15 years as Calvin College's Vice President for Student Life and has spent more than a decade practicing law as a partner in a firm, as well as serving on the boards of several community organizations and schools, including the New Haven County Bar Association and Calvin College, as well as a founding board member of the Bridgeport Rescue Mission. She received her bachelor's from Calvin and her Juris Doctorate with honors from the University of Connecticut School of Law. Finally, Pete Weiner is a senior fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center, as well as a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. He writes widely on political, cultural, and religious publication issues for publications such as the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Atlantic, the Financial Times, National Affairs, and Time Magazine, and was recently listed by, uh, by Forbes Magazine as, quote, one of conservatism's leading educators and practitioners of first principles. In addition, Pete has served in the last three Republican administrations, including as the Deputy Director of Speech Writing and later Director of the Office of Strategic Initiatives, also known as Strategery, for President George W. Bush. He is the co-author of City of Man, Religion and Politics in a New Era uh, with Mike Gerson, as well as the co-author along with Arthur Brooks of Wealth and Justice, The Morality of Democratic Capitalism. Through his writing, he often defends the liberal arts and academic freedoms. So we'll hear tonight brief opening statements from each of our panelists before turning to a moderated conversation and then, of course, a questions from the audience. Michael, lead us off. Great. Well, thank you so much, Cherie. It's a great honor and privilege to be here. And uh, I, I feel like that I'm getting to share the stage with my heroes. Uh, Shirley has been an incredible friend, an ally, a partner, and has come to be a, a great encouragement to me. Shirley has an amazing gift of seeing the glass half full. And for college presidents, that's a good word these days. <laughs> and we very much appreciate it. Pete Wainer, I first got to meet when I was a graduate student at Princeton. I interviewed him when he was in the White House and he's been my hero ever since. Pete's been a, a very good uh, advisor and counselor, a friend and encourager, as uh, we've tried to be faithful at Gordon College and trying to also help show the way for other institutions. So um, it really is a privilege to be here with both of you. Thank you very much. One of the things that I'm interested in talking with you tonight about and hoping to hear in the conversation some chances to hear your thoughts is what should Christian higher education look like? The church, after all, basically invented higher education. All of the institutions of higher learning uh, from the very beginning grew out of the monastic schools in the Middle Ages. And certainly in the early days of the American Republic, they were deeply infused with Christian vision and mor morality and a, a desire to try and make a very positive difference in the wider world. Today, uh, in my role, helping to provide leadership at Gordon College, I'm oftentimes trying to think about where should we be going too many of us, I think, focus our energy and attention around what the most pressing issue of today 
when in fact really what we need to be thinking about is what's the pressing issue for 10 years from now and how can we align the institution in that direction? There are a few things that I think are, are worthy of our time and energy and might be helpful sort of um, ideas to think about as we explore jointly this idea of Christian higher education. One is that I very much think that we need to help embody and to help propagate flexible frameworks. What we know is that the college-bound population today, 65% of them, according to the Department of Labor, are going to work in careers that have not yet been invented. 65% of them. So what that means is that most of higher education that is focused around skills development and helping students land their first job are going to be obsolete for 65% of our students. So instead of focusing our time and energy on helping those students land what that first job is, we need to be thinking about what's going to be their job and their career 10, 15 years down the road. One of the reasons why I love Gordon College, and you should all send your kids to Gordon College, it's a really great institution, is because we really believe in the liberal arts approach to life. We think it really is the very best way to provide higher education to help students to be able to think across many different fields. We think it's important, for example, for students who feel called to vocations in medicine to also know about literature and history. We think it's important for business owners to know something about science and chemistry and the arts. The liberal arts approach that Gordon tries to embody, and frankly, most Christian institutions believe is the framework of how to help develop students for the next opportunities that God will bring along their path. We think that this is one of the key ways that Christian institutions could actually light the way for the rest of higher education down the road. You see, most of higher education today has become largely about skills development and about job placement. Most of us put our time and energy around what kind of jobs do our graduates make uh, and land when they graduate? What are their first year earnings? And in the process of that, I think we're giving up an important dimension of the real purpose of higher education, helping to cultivate and develop flexible frameworks, that liberal arts mind that's able to think through different ideas and concepts. A second thing that I think is really important for us is to help students to develop what we might call a, a voyager's vision, an idea that helps them to see a much wider world that's out there. Throughout most of the Protestant tradition, there was this understanding about vocation. What we would have in our, our live calling is what John Calvin likens to a sentry post. And he says, we're given this vocation so that we don't heedlessly wander about the earth. Sounds very Calvinistic. And I like that notion, but I'm much more attracted to the thinking of Karl Barth, who likened Christian vocation not to a sentry post, but instead to a journey to new harbors. I like this progressive element because in many ways, we're helping to cultivate the next generation of young people who are gonna have not one or two jobs, but 14, 15, 20 jobs over the course of their life and helping them to cultivate a much broader perspective. For us at Gordon, that entails a real commitment to global education. Our vision is that 90% of our students will have had a significant global experience by the time they graduate. Whether it means that they live abroad, they study abroad, they work abroad, or they serve abroad, during a part of their time at Gordon College. And we think that that sort of voyager's vision, helping them to see the much wider world, it helps them get out of the parochialism that we see so much in the wider world. And one of the things that really concerns me is that today we have become so obsessed with things like you know, trigger warnings and the war on Christmas, when in fact we're not uh, unnerved by the atrocities of Boko Haram or the genocide of Christians in places like uh, Iraq and Syria. We must develop a generation of young people who pay attention to the wider world. So we need to develop within our students not just a flexible framework which helps prepare them for life after college, not just a voyager's vision which helps them think about the much wider world, but we also need to cultivate within them a fearless faith. Too many Christians today are afraid of what the wider world thinks about them. We become so enamored with cultural relevance that we actually don't know what we believe or why. And we're very circumspect when it comes time to make a courageous stand for our faith. So what, one of the things that I hope Christian education can do is help a generation of young people to develop this commitment 
to being unafraid to stand up for what they believe is the gospel. Now, let me say, the gospel is an offense, but we don't have to embody it in an offensive way. And too many Christians, I think, do embody the gospel in an offensive way. So what we want to try and do is help our students to embody what John chapter 1 describes Jesus as being full of both grace and truth. And we know that John was a careful enough writer that he wanted the order of those words to matter. You must first encounter the grace of God before you can encounter the truth of God. And so we want to try and lead in a fearless faith kind of way that also embodies grace and truth. So those are a couple of ideas of what I'm hoping Christian higher education could look like in the days ahead and look forward to the conversation. And what Michael describes is exactly what happens at Gordon College and what happens at the other 181 institutions that are a part of the Christian Colleges and Universities Association, which I had. It's actually not a small movement. Worldwide, there are over 520,000 students every year looking towards this Christian higher education. In the United States alone, it's about 450,000 students, 79,000 faculty and staff are educating young people each and every year. What is truly amazing is that the economic imprint for Christian higher education in the United States is $60 billion a year. That's the value that we're adding to the economic life of the United States. And one of the things that we are so sold out for as part of the diversity of education is that we know that families want to send their children to places that align with their values. And we know that there are many families of faith that say that 18 to 22 or 23 year range, or when we go to get a master's or a graduate program, we want a worldview that is going to shape the kinds of questions and give the kinds of answers to exactly the kinds of things that Michael talked about. You're going to have more than one job. You might have to be making decisions throughout your whole life about where you're going to place your most important resource, which is your time. And you want that person to make a really good decision. So how would you give that person the fundamentals in order to make the best decisions in their life? And that, we believe, would be Christian higher education because there is no question off limits. Um, my daughter I obtained a very good education from Calvin College. I'm a Calvin grad. My husband's a Calvin grad. She is her husband, my son, and his wife. Mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't get a six-party discount. <laughs> but what I know about that is that when she went to get her master's degree at University of Michigan, she was completely well prepared and she was able to speak about the things that mattered to her, which was also their, her faith. But what she found there, unlike what she found at a Christian college, was that that state institution was not as interested in talking about the meaning and purpose of life, nor about the big questions that included a sovereign or creator God. And yet Christian higher education, like higher education as a whole, let me tell you, just the liberal arts are about writing, speaking, the ability to learn, the ability to move through life in your vocation, to create a noble life at its very best, to be a good citizen, and to be a better human. And we think that in Christian higher education, I'd like to share with you five distinctives. And I'm actually going to draw on the writing of Peter here, because I think he writes so wisely and so eloquently time and time again. And in his writing, he captures some of the uh, essence and the practical nature of why God matters. And continuingly, we're, work we're living in a society where saying that God matters is, in some ways, perhaps offensive to people who do not actually have yet the joy and the hope of feeling the love of God and loving God back. So the first thing, here's what's true. Leading a Christian life is an intentional undertaking and is bolstered and supported by studying Jesus, having habits of faith, and people who become co-journeyers. It's an intentional practice. You don't just catch a deep Christian life. It's something that you learn how to do well with others. Second, the importance of Christian higher education gives you people with whom you are going to have common values, a common purpose, 
a common commitment to keeping promises. Think about that, keeping promises, and how that is not a given anymore. Telling the truth is not a given anymore. Peter wrote about the incarnation, which also underscores the importance of relationships and, in particular, friendships. So at Christian colleges, when you start with some common, common goals, common values, common commitments, you get to have deep friendships, and those friendships last throughout your whole life. And it's not um, a frivolous thing. Deep friendships are the kind of attribute in a life that make a life well lived. Here's what uh, Peter said. When friends served as God's proxies, they are dispensing grace that I could not receive in solitude. Isn't that true? Thirdly, higher education should teach about the purpose and meaning of life and raise up students to be deep souls, personally and professionally, deep souls. So Anthony Cronman, who wrote about public higher education, said, um, we no longer get to be talking about what really matters, the purpose and meaning of life. Where are you going to talk about that in a really organized way, but in higher education? It is my hope that all of higher education would do that, because uh, the Harry study out of UCLA said that students today, 71% consider themselves spiritual, 54% consider themselves religious, and yet only 19% of uh, faculty by a junior year had actually raised the questions of purpose and meaning in their classrooms. Would you really want the person who is so precious to you, your son or daughter, to not be able to discuss the meaning and purpose of life? My mother-in-law went to meet Jesus face to face on Sunday, this past Sunday. And I was so grateful that she was a person of faith. My father-in-law was a person of faith. My husband is a person of faith. And they sacrificed in order for their children to go to Christian day school and then Christian college. And now we are the recipients of that legacy. But what is our only comfort in life and in death? That we belong to Jesus Christ. And that is not an incidental thing. Fourth, what makes a life worth living? Christian College President Barry Corey says that we need to have a firm center and soft edges. It is the learning how to give and receive grace and forgiveness. It is the opportunity to at least explore what happens when we die. Pete again wrote that grace and redemption are finally and fully found in a story of love. When the divine became human, I didn't enter Jesus' world. He entered mine. Something we're thinking about for Lent. Shirley Mullen of Houghton College says that Christian higher education is the best avenue to develop deep people. And Richard Foster said that the world needs now more than ever deep people. And you're, you know this is true. Superficiality is the curse of our age. The doctrine of instant satisfaction is a primary spiritual problem. The desperate need today is not for a greater number of intelligent people or gifted people, but for deep people. Because Christian higher education doesn't cordon off the questions that are most meaningful, we have the best opportunity to create deep people. Lastly, fifth, all the leadership studies and books including the ones that Michael has written so eloquently, say that successful leaders are self-aware leaders. Uh, if you've ever worked for a leader, don't you prefer a self-aware leader? Mm -hmm. Christians should have the corner on being self-aware because of the virtues that the scripture teaches, and one in particular is humility. The virtue of humility, praised by both Brooks and Wainer, is the foundation to success. Now, in culture today, I think that Christians are not always found to be humble as our first adjective. Sometimes we're described as um, self-righteous and perhaps judgmental. Yet, this doesn't mean that followers of Jesus, and I'm quoting Peter here, should be indifferent to a moral order grounded in eternal truths or unable to judge some of their own shortcomings. Instead, to an awareness of the waywardness of their own hearts 
or how even good acts are often tainted by selfish motives. We should think about all those things. This is not an argument for self-loathing, but it is an argument for self-awareness. And the liberal arts, through the lens of faith, is the best opportunity to teach the virtue of humility, which will give us the self-awareness to be the most successful people for the kingdom of God. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, lovely. It's, it's great to uh, be here, ladies and gentlemen, um, to be on this panel. Um, just a quick word. Uh, Shirley, you've, you've provided great leadership uh, at a time um, that, uh, of, of real challenges and, and when the tectonic plates are shifting. Mm -hmm. Um, and you've been able to do it with, with real integrity. Uh, and so uh, uh, I wanted to thank you and the institutions you represent. Uh, Michael, if I, I have known him for, for many years. Um, he's a really impressive guy. He's a terrific scholar, but he is also a person of real uh, moral character and integrity. And when Gordon and he were going through some tough times, some tough challenges um, that had nothing to do with them, uh, and everything to do with the fact that he was being true to his faith. Um, he represented a word that's come up a couple of times uh, tonight, which is grace. And that capacity to represent grace, particularly in hard times, uh, is a tremendous uh, gift. And I just want to say with Sheree in the Trinity form, Sheree is a former uh, colleague uh, of mine. Uh, we've served uh, at <laughs> Empower. <laughs> We worked at Empower America, uh, and she's been a friend ever since. I'd, I've admired her for a long time. In the Trinity Forum, um, I have uh, several friends. We get together with dinner with periodically. Uh, writers, David Brooks, you've all lived in, Michael Gerson, and me. Many of them are familiar. You all are familiar with it because they've spoken here before. And I guess this was last year when we were talking, and we found ourselves saying that in this moment, to sort of, uh, political and civic moment, um, that it was important that there be individuals and institutions who light candles that don't just curse the darkness, and that we needed really to think about that and to be able to, to highlight that uh, and to applaud people that do that. And the Trinity Forum uh, is one of those institutions that, that lights candles, and, um, and we, we need it. Um, I'll say a few words that's going to echo some of what you've um, heard before. Um, these two are the practitioners uh, when it comes to Christian higher education. I, I'm an admirer. Um, but when Cherie and I spoke, uh, I thought maybe I'd do some, some framing observations and, and then uh, we can start the conversation. Um, I'll just tell you what my premise, my proposition is. Um, and that is, as uh, Michael was saying, that universities in the West began as a Christian project. And I'd say today that Christian universities are in many cases uh, carrying forward the best of that project. Um, it is remarkable um, when you think about uh, the best and the earliest and the oldest of uh, England and America's universities that they really were established as religious and Christian institutions. You had Harvard and Yale, which were influenced by the Puritans. John Harvard, he was named after, was a, was a young minister. Princeton, where you went, uh, Presbyterian. John Witherspoon, uh, I think he was the sixth president. He's a hugely influential figure, James Madison, among others. Um, he's actually the only clergyman uh, and college professor who signed the Declaration of Independence. Um, and in, in England, Oxford, Cambridge, St. Andrews. So all of these institutions um, really had roots that were, that were Christian roots. Um, and I'd say that in many cases today, these Christian uh, universities are models of what it means to be a, a university rightly understood and what it means to be a well-educated um, person. Um, and I just want to say, make two observations in this um, current moment as it relates to higher education and, and, and Christian higher education. Uh, the first is that um, arguably the most serious immediate problem facing uh, a lot of colleges and universities um, in the United States um, is a confusion over what the core purpose uh, of the academy and the college education is. Uh, and that is uh, freedom of inquiry and freedom of expression. Uh, and so instead of enlarging um, minds, you have way too many students today who are either being shielded uh, by the administration or they're shielding themselves uh, from words and ideas that they uh, don't like or that they don't understand. Um, 
I've described it as that we're treating them like porcelain dolls, that they're fragile uh, and that they need safe spaces and we have to worry about trigger warnings and protection uh, from microaggressions. And it's a kind of Orwellian moment in a way where you have these prominent colleges and universities whose very purpose uh, should um, include exposing students to competing ideas, uh, to competing points of view, and allow intellectual debate to flourish. And instead, they've become institutions of intolerance. I think in, in many respects, the most intolerant institutions in American life today uh, are, are contemporary colleges and universities. So there's this effort to scrub um, campuses of words and ideas and subjects uh, that might give offense uh, or cause discomfort. And so I think Christian universities can really be are, but can continue to be um, on the forefront of creating a culture where free expression is um, valued and understood, and really to show that they are not uh, afraid to engage uh, and to debate uh, and to hear dissent. Uh, you know, and, and I think about Paul uh, on, uh, on Mars Hill or engaged uh, what he referred to as the men of Athens. Uh, he wasn't afraid of doing that, and he developed a vocabulary that was both true to his beliefs, but that they were able to hear uh, as well, which is, which is important uh, to, um, to do. So I think sometimes crises create opportunities, uh, and there is this opportunity now for Christian universities really to embody this in a way that contrasts it with with what the, uh, what the trend lines in, in a lot of non-Christian universities are. Second point that I wanted to make is because there is so much attention today on the matter of uh, free speech, uh, and that's to say that universities uh, don't exist simply uh, to allow free speech and free inquiry, but they also exist um, to search for truth and to create men and women who are devoted um, to the search for justice and who um, believe that we can apprehend, better apprehend than we do uh, the beautiful uh, and the good and the true. And I do think that the best of, of the Christian universities today, um, they don't stop at this idea that there are just questions out there. So sometimes it's, it strikes me that it's kind of fashionable today for people to think, I will forever hover. You know, I'm just going to go in there and question everything, and everything is doubt. I understand that. I, my own Christian pilgrimage was, was one that, that in which there was doubt along the way and struggles. Faith didn't come easily to me. But in the end, you can't commit your life to doubt uh, or to questions. In the end, you have to settle on certain, uh, certain deeper truths. Um, and you have to settle questions like what is justice and what should be loved and what deserves to be defended and what's the purpose uh, of life on this earth. And the way that you go about answering those questions for universities isn't through indoctrination, it's not through pop propaganda, it's through a genuine engagement um, with the best that's been thought and said and written. And that's really through great books and great teachers and great classmates, um, which are really, in the end, great conversations um, whose conclusions aren't foreordained, um, that these things emerge through a kind of dialectic, through a back and forth. Um, and, uh, and that's really what friendship, part of what friendship, I think, brings, which is different perspectives. It's really in the tradition of Peter Abelard, who was um, the medieval French philosopher and, and theologian and, and uh, logician. And he talked about this great sick at non, this great um, yes and no on the human condition. Um, and so on the merits of the religious life, who do you follow? Do you follow Aquinas or do you follow Voltaire? Or on the virtue of uh, politics? Is it Aristotle or is it Machiavelli? I and mean, those are questions that are important and they, they aren't the sum total of what universities should do. There's the practical aspect, that there, there's the career aspect. But that is in part, uh, I believe, part of what they should uh, do. Um, William James, uh, who was this 19th century uh, American philosopher and, and uh, psychologist, said that a college education's best claim uh, is that it helps one to value what deserves to be valued. And he said um, of Harvard, of all places, uh, that the only rational ground for the preeminent admiration for any single college would be uh, its preeminent spiritual tone. Now that 
is out of touch uh, with the times. And I, uh, I accept the fact that that sounds hopelessly out of date. Um, but uh, I'll end on a hunch, um, which is that today I think we're seeing in life what life in a post-truth uh, world, and frankly in a post-truth political world, uh, looks like. Uh, and it's not a pretty picture. Uh, and I do think that in the end, um, people may long to reclaim certain concept and virtues that they uh, once treasured, um, but have been stripped away. I think sometimes we do, in, in, in individual lives and in the life of a nation, you begin to take for granted um, certain things. Um, but when they really are taken away, things you find out that you really did cherish them after all, and you find out that life um, can be a lot uh, cruder and crueler and more brutish when those things are being gone. Um, and so I think in some ways um, what is happening is we're, we're living through in, you know, in certain ways in our life what it means to have some of these virtues gone and that I think a lot of Christian universities represent. And so I do think that there's, a, there's an opening. There's a lovely line that Wordsworth wrote in, in a poem, The Prelude, uh, where he said, what we have loved, others will love, and we will teach them how. Uh, and I do think uh, that for Christian universities, uh, what they've loved, others will love, uh, and they're going about the business of teaching them how. And I think that that's a, that's a good and high and noble calling, and I'm glad that they're doing it. So thanks. Thanks, Pete, Shirley, Michael. So we could go in so many different directions, <laughs> but let's start uh, with the basics. And one of the most basic aspects of a liberal arts education is the ability to read well. But by all accounts, reading is in decline in America. Uh, we are reading less, we are comprehending what we read less, we are reading literature far less, and it gets worse the younger one gets. So uh, the younger one is, in the aggregate, the less reading one is doing. There's obviously implications of this for education, uh, but there are particular implications for those of us who claim to follow the word made flesh and who believe that in the beginning was the word. So what are the implications for the future of Christian higher education in educating well and transmitting a sense of what is to be loved and valued and pursuing that truth uh, to a generation who's having a harder time reading or comprehending what they read? Well, they're looking at me. <laughs> uh, so there's, in life, there is always the tension uh, between adaptability and tradition, right? So, uh, we have to teach and hold to the incredibly important traditions such as us spending time with yourself and the things that you need to read in order to comprehend. So how do you teach that? Well, one is the practice of Sabbath, right? So if you have practices on a campus or in your life that says, you know what, sometimes you turn things off sometimes you rearrange your life, that actually is going to give some of the best space to continue to hold in the crucible of the push for change, the very basics, which is, can I sit by myself? Can I not be with others? Can I, um, uh, can I hold my attention on something that's important? Luckily, faculty at Christian colleges um, are, are not swayed by the fact that they should not be assigning the papers and uh, doing the reading. I bet if you asked uh, any of the recent, uh, or there's many students here tonight, um, do they think their faculty are getting easier on them? Right, they're not, are they? Mm -hmm. uh, they're d demanding a lot. Uh, you're, the faculty at Gordon, for instance, it's a very rigorous institution and they're demanding a lot. Uh, but, there, but people are always trying to be pushed towards something new. So the wisdom and discernment to hold on and be adaptable is really the crux of being in a, a human today. Let me also flip over from reading to technology. So there have been lots of technological developments that have already made huge impacts in the classroom, whether 
It's the advent of MOOCs, massive open online courses, or new efforts to flip the classroom where instruction is now uh, delivered you know, over the internet and the gatherings, the teacher is really more of a convener uh, than an instructor. Uh, but most Christian philosophers will say that while technology is a tool, it is not philosophically neutral. It is a way of conditioning how we perceive reality and conditioning our loves. Has adequate attention been paid to the way technology is changing the future of Christian education? Well, we're certainly engaging in the conversation in ways that we weren't engaging 10 years ago, which I'm encouraged by. And I think part of it is a recognition that students are coming to our campuses and um, Sadly, a lot of our families have taken for, have just assumed that whatever the cultural mores are around technology, that that's how they ought to organize their life. So um, we try, for example, to teach our students the importance of actually turning off the cell phone for the worship hour. You would not think that's a radical idea, but actually everything about our lives, including worship services these days, are so technologically driven that it requires enormous self-discipline for members of a congregation not to check their iPhones to see what's you know, happening, what their email, what their latest text is. I gotta tell you, nobody's texting on Sunday morning, so just leave it be, but for some reason, we are so driven by the technology it's overtaken our lives. I do think Christian colleges as uh, institutions that have an, a deep appreciation for certain kinds of spiritual practices are better positioned than other institutions of higher learning to lead the way of helping this current generation to figure out how can they actually take a Sabbath from technology. Um, I think about a uh, sister institution, Azusa Pacific University out in California, and their leadership team, for example, actively encourages their uh, faculty and staff to take Sabbath rest from technology over the weekend, mm -hmm. to, uh, to not be connected over email for those uh, 48 hours. There are all kinds of ways that we can contact people if something happens. It's called a telephone. We've had it for a long time. But it does not require you to be on your email. But actually taking that kind of a position is countercultural even in the church today. And so one of the, the great challenges that we face is to help our students and their parents to get to a place where they are comfortable with not always being technologically connected. We run a study abroad program in Orvieto, Italy. It's halfway between Rome and Florence. And probably the most radical idea of that study abroad program is that we all only allow students to have access to technology for a couple of hours a day. Now, they save up all of that technology energy and they make really good use of it for those two hours when they have it. But what they find is that not having access to the internet all the time and not having access to their email all the time and not having their cell phone on all the time, it actually has a way of reorienting their lives. And in this way, I think Christian colleges are well positioned to help light the way for other institutions that are beginning to recognize the real challenges that we face in this globally connected world where we are constantly wired and we can never turn off. It's my hope that that would be one of the contributions we might be able to make in the wider world of higher education. And I, I, if I, the self-reflection that you're actually teaching students. See, I think that Christian colleges, by, in, now more than ever, are countercultural, right? We still have men and women's dorms. Uh, it's not open access in the way that, uh, that there's sort of an everything goes. We think about human sexuality in a way that is countercultural. There's this deep respect. But teaching people to be comfortable being countercultural is actually one of the skills that will help you evaluate what's a new trend and how far to go with that trend. Yeah, I wanted to uh, pick up on a couple of, of points. Um, I, mean, I think this, this technology revolution is, is just extraordinary and huge. Um, and we know now from brain science that, that yeah. brains, particularly young young people because they've been growing up with this, are really being, uh, actually, there's a physiological change, they're being, being reshaped. So this is a huge um, challenge uh, to have this generation of grow up on, um, uh, on, the, uh, on the iPhone. Um, I, there's no easy answer to it. Uh, I think part of it is, certainly as parents, you've just got to try and, and, and uh, 
uh, create uh, barriers uh, to, to things. My wife really gets the credit for, for this, but um, we uh, haven't allowed our kids to get iPhones until they're 17, which makes us extremely oh. old-fashioned. Uh, <laughs> but we were having, uh, you know, it's, it's Cindy. Uh, she, she, was, she was the one. She understood you kind of the, the, you know, the dangers of this um, much more than I did. But we, so we were having a lunch and uh, our daughter is now 18, she has it, but she said, uh, unprovoked, I might add, uh, she said, I think it was a really good idea that you didn't give it to me uh, until I was 17. And her 13-year-old brother was there, so I was extremely grateful to her. Uh, I, paid, I paid for her lunch that, uh, that, that, uh, that day. But it's, it's, it's not easy. I will say this, though, that... Um, Human nature isn't going to change, and this well, part of what's happening, if you read the, the social science literature, is that we've never had a generation as plugged in technologically uh, before, and we have this enormous, um, uh, epi almost epidemic of loneliness uh, and, and, and atomization. And people are made to be in community. That's, you know, Aristotle was right, we're, we're social animals. Um, and we need that. And part of what's happening, of course, is that this, uh, this age of technology and smartphones and, and everything else is that there's this disconnect that's going on. And I do think, uh, both for Christian colleges and universities, but really the church more broadly, that there really is a genuine um, uh, social crisis of loneliness that it explains the opioid epidemic in part. It explains this, the, 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 the large increase we've seen recently, well, over several years now in, in suicide. Um, and that really is what the church is so well equipped to do, which is to create institutions um, that help people travel the, the journey uh, and, and, to, and, and to create those, those human communities. Um, so I think that's very important. And there's one more thing on, on the issue of the books. Um, and again, it's a very good question. But so one of the things you have to do is I think you have to protect. But the other thing is you have to give young people uh, and really all of us just great books. Um, because as I was saying earlier about, uh, you know, about human nature, we love stories. And there's something about the moral imagination that wants to be captured and taken um, and great books do that. And so what you have to do is both protect them against the worst elements, but then you have to give them the kinds of things um, that will, that will uh, actually satisfy their, their soul. Now, that may say, sound rather high-minded if you're talking to a 16 or 17-year-old, uh, but we all know what we're talking about, which is something about some kind of fulfillment. And right now, there's, there isn't a lot of fulfillment in a lot of lives that's going on. And there are different ways that we have as people of faith, I think, to, 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 uh, to create that. I actually want to dig in on that point on loneliness. One of the things that has uh, struck even a casual reader uh, is the amount of literature that details both the, the drive and the energy and the creativity and the entrepreneurial spirit of today's students, but coupled with a both fragility and a deep sense of loneliness. Uh, David Brooks just recently had a very interesting article where he, uh, I'll even read from it, he was talking with different students who said, we're more connected, but we're more apart. Uh, one student lamented, again and again, students expressed a hunger for social and emotional bonding for a shift from guilt and accusation towards empathy. How do you create relationship, one student asked. That may be the longing that undergirds all others. Uh, there's, there's a sad irony um, to be one of the most technologically connected uh, peer groups in you know, all of history, uh, and yet the, among the most alienated um, and often harboring feelings of rejection as well. You know, and as you mentioned, uh, Pete, this seems like a serious problem for which Christian higher education has a very unique uh, ability to speak into and, and to, to address. So uh, Shirley and Michael, how can um, the future of Christian higher ed address what is not just an acute need among students, uh, but also such a broad societal need as well? You know, one of the things that I think that uh, I see every day, so I spent the majority of my career in secular higher education. I was at Princeton, I was at Rice, so when I came to Gordon, I was struck by how countercultural the campus environment really was. And one of the ways in which it was countercultural is that we actually spoke to each other when we passed one another on the sidewalk. 
That's actually something that doesn't happen in most of higher education today. And if you're on a college or university campus, there is a moroseness in the spirit. It's a, it's a sullenness. There's, you know, these are young people who are bright and talented and have their whole lives in front of them, but most college campuses are filled with pretty unhappy people. There's no joy. And I think that the challenge is that for a variety of, of reasons, and I think it's related to the breakdown of the family, and having an entire generation of people who, as Robert Putnam would put it, have been bowling alone. They actually have not learned how to develop deep friendships and how to relate to one another. So one of the things that we try to do on Gordon's campus is to just help our students understand how to deepen those relationships, how to develop friendships, how to get off of your iPhone when you're sitting at a meal table and to talk to the person across the table from you. Now, that wasn't a challenge 50 years ago, but today it's a whole different sort of ball game. And so helping our students um, to develop friendships, one of the things I'm trying to encourage Gordon students to do is to date. Simple things like dating. We have a generation of young people who they don't actually know how dating works. And they're intimidated by it. And, and we're so afraid of rejection that we won't actually take the, the step of asking somebody out on a date. So I try to tell students, you know, I ask my wife out on a date. When I preach in, in chapel, I'll talk about my dating life. Uh, because actually they need some models some healthy relational models out there of how you engage somebody and how you sort of navigate the ups and downs that go along with that. Final thing that I'll say, and I'm sure Shirley um, has a lot more wisdom about this because anyone who's been a vice president for student life has to deal with these challenges. I think that probably one of the antidotes that Christian higher education has as a resource that the rest of higher education does not is what uh, the sociologist Peter Berger used to refer to as a sacred canopy that there was this idea that there was a, a uniting principle that could sort of help bring people together. Today, the, the sacred canopy for most of higher education has been broken up into secular umbrellas that we hold over ourselves. There's not this sort of overarching framework that help unites us. The benefit of being on a Christian college campus is that there's a shared sense of beliefs and convictions. And we have lots of disagreements and lots of fights and arguments about theology and convictions and ideology and politics. But there is at least a shared understanding of what the world ought to look like. And that has a way of helping to create the beginning of relationships, which in turn help develop lifelong friendships, help you meet your spouse, and in the process of that, help to uh, buffer the alienating effect that you see so much uh, on America's college campuses today. No, Michael, you're right about that. Uh, there is a sadness, uh, partly because, and I think we all feel it, uh, there is a heightened anxiety. Uh, partly because on our cell phone, which is a computer right in our hand, you can read about all the things that are very worrisome right, international things that are very worrisome. And students carry that around with them. Um, and so how do we, uh, and you know, the world was difficult in, a, in every generation. It's not like this is the most difficult generation. It's always been challenging. Um, and faith should give an anchor so that we know that we are to be faithful, but we don't have to complete it. Uh, so uh, actually having this ability to answer the anxiety that students have is one of the um, opportunities that Christian colleges have. But I, I do want to say that the anxiety is real, not just for them, it's across the spectrum. This ability to always compare yourself to others. Um, you know, there's been a lot written about, while well, social media, and I have to say, you know, I, I love my cell phone. Uh, I, I love being connected uh, because of the new technology. I, I think there are some, so, so many pluses to it, but the shadow side is um, that there is a, um, a pretend that's happening in, in, in what's created on that. And, uh, and so we have to actually call that out and speak honestly about it. And what Michael alluded to also is that family structures are not the same today as they were in the past. And that doesn't mean that they were all perfect in the past. Uh, but there is something about um, having a, 
adults that you can go to, whether it's your parents or others, and I, I think the phrase that it takes a community uh, is very important, uh, that those are the sorts of antidotes for when students come and have, uh, unfortunately, even more, uh, uh, more of a sense of I don't belong or I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to actively name it, and we have to give, and I'm just going to end with this, James K.A. Smith talks about developing habits of the heart. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm not always eager to go on Sunday morning to church. Uh, oh, I could read my paper. You know, I could have an unstructured day. But what I do know is that a habit of a heart helps you reconnect with that community that is your church community, and you almost never regret exercising behavior out of a good habit. Mm -hmm. And that is something else that we can talk about in Christian College Campus. And I think it is an antidote to the lack of joy. We'll move from habits of the heart to money worries, uh, which is <laughs> one of the big stressors on higher ed right now is uh, the ways in which the prices are rising, student debt is rising, student default rates are rising. It's led to not only a lot of pressure on the individual student, uh, but you now actually see different technologists offering scholarships for people who skip college altogether. Uh, how will higher Christian education be affected uh, by, by the money constraints? And do you see a change in the industry itself coming up? One of the toughest decisions we have to make on an annual basis is what to set the price for next year. It's incredibly difficult because uh, actually everyone's talking about the rising rates of higher education, but nobody's talking about the rising rates, for example, of what it costs to go to the dentist. It's actually the rate of increases for dentist visits is far greater than the rise of higher education over the last 25 years. Now, you may not know that because maybe your dental insurance is paying it, not you yourself. But actually, what we have found is that there's tens of maybe, you know, 100 different industries whose prices and rates have gone much higher than higher education. Why is it that people are talking about higher education? It's because it used to be that families would save up to send their sons and daughters to go to colleges and universities. And something over the last 25 years has changed where families would prefer to have a newer car or a larger house or a nicer vacation. And so they have opted not to save as much in the same way. For example, the cost to a student to go to Gordon College this year is less than what it was for that student to go last year. Now, the sticker price went up, but the actual discount that we provide through scholarships also went up to a larger measure. So if families have not saved up for it, um, they're feeling this pressure around what are you going to do because we recognize, I mean, higher education in the United States, there's a reason why it's the global gold standard. It's the very best in the world, but it's also the most expensive model. It relies upon, most, most cases, it relies upon a, a relationally intensive model where you have people who have spent years going to school to learn their field, but also learn how to relate to students. And you're wanting them to have this deep mentoring relationship, and it, it costs money to be able to make that happen. One of the things that I hope that we can be able to see is a, a different sort of paradigm. I've had a, a lot of families who say to me, I don't want to take on any debt for higher education. I understand that, and I, I respect their decisions. But the thing that is odd to me is how we without question we'll be willing to take on debt, for example, for our house, which if you're lucky, over the course of your 30-year mortgage, if you're lucky, the value of that house might double in that time period. But you're not willing to take on debt for higher education, which we already know is going to increase in value five, six, seven times over the lifetime of that student. So why would you take on debt for a house that might get a 2x return, but not take it on for higher education, which is going to get a 5, 6, or 7x return on that investment? I think the real challenge that what we have to do is to be able to help students to be able to see the real value of what they get and to be savvy consumers in the process of that. Shirley has been involved in helping to demonstrate the value of the kind of institutions that we provide. And I will certainly say there are plenty of bad actors in the industry of higher education. So we certainly recognize that. But I think it's also important to recognize the positive difference that comes from the kind of institutions that Shirley leads. Yeah, so uh, Michael, you're right on about uh, asking a different question. Um, what is the value for what you're paying? 
And if you're going to invest in something that is going to be a lifelong return, is that worth it? And actually, here's the real stats. Uh, students come out with debt of a, between 24000 and 32000 That's it. You hear the stories about the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And for professional programs, that can be true. But the average debt, and this is according to uh, the Council for Independent Colleges, so it's not just Christian colleges, it's across the board, $24,000 to $32,000. Amortize that um, and see if that's worth the investment. Uh, the other thing is that our institutions, uh, Christian colleges, really have so much merit aid, need-based aid, that uh, always students should check out, say, well, here is what the sticker price is, but with what I am going to contribute to my institution that I might like to join, what is, how are they going to partner with me? Uh, college graduates earn more than a million dollars more than uh, individuals that have not gone to get their college degree. Uh, but more importantly, there's a quality of life, a citizenship that's formed, this noble life that is formed, um, that I believe that it is an excellent investment, one of the best that you can make. They always, my father would always say, don't buy a new car because you drive it off the lot and it depreciates immediately. But when you invest in higher education, we think particularly Christian higher education, um, you are actually getting an increasing gain, as Michael said. Two last points. Students who attend Christian colleges have the lowest default rate of anyone in the sector. Uh, they are repaying their loans, um, and they're graduating at a higher percentage. Those are all the kinds of things that happen because of good community and faculty involvement. So we're going to turn to the most dynamic part of our evening symposium, which is questions from the audience. And those of you who have been to a Trinity Forum event before know we have but three guidelines to guide uh, this question and answer time, which is we simply ask that all of your questions be brief, that they be civil, and that all questions should be in the form of a question. Uh, so we, two of our very able interns, Nathaniel and Caleb, will have microphones. Uh, please wait to be called on and for the microphone to get to you before speaking. I'm actually going to stand up so I can see you all better. Uh, yes, a question right there. Gerald. Thank you uh, for your excellent presentation this evening. Uh, Robert Benny, in his 2000 book, Quality with Soul, suggests that to survive as vibrant Christian institutions, Christian colleges need a clear vision, ethos, and people committed to the institution's Christian commitment. How do the organizations you represent uh, help Christian colleges accomplish this amidst the secular challenges to marriage and family, creationism, and orthodox Christian doctrines? Who wants to tackle that? Let me give a testimonial uh, to the leadership that Shirley and her colleagues have provided at the Council for Christian Colleges and Universities. So three years ago, Gordon College became the object of some public attention over our Community Life Covenant. So it's a covenant we've had uh, on, the, on the books for decades, and it basically articulates a vision for Christian community that's uh, part of the Christian tradition that goes back for 2,000 years. Not a radical idea. But in our uh, contemporary environment, it's countercultural. And there was a group of folks who wanted to see if they could apply some pressure on the institution to perhaps get the institution to change. And they chose Gordon in particular because uh, Gordon is, a, is a, a leader within the Christian college movement. And we were located in a part of the country that uh, a Christian vision for community is, is perhaps particularly countercultural. Because we are a member of the CCCU, uh, we were able to take advantage of the resources. Of, uh, they were able to advise us. They were able to provide support. They were able to advocate for our position, help us make connections, represent us in the, the public square, and walk alongside us. And I think that the experiences that Gordon had three years ago are coming to every single Christian institution in America over the next 10 years. Not just every Christian college, but I think actually every congregation every Christian nonprofit organization, every faith-based organization is going to have to grapple with the challenge of how do you engage in a civil way when you have countercultural convictions in a pluralistic public square? And that public square in some ways has become more antagonistic to Christian convictions. And so I simply want to just say personally how very grateful I am for uh, Shirley and the leadership that she provides, the ironic spirit in which she's able to help us hold convictions, but also do it in a way that still smiles at people and communicates that we really do love folks, even if we disagree. 
And in the process of that, helps model for us how we could actually model for our students this grace and truth that we think is really important. I, I, I thank you for that, uh, Michael. And, and it was such a, uh, it was a joy to represent such an incredible institution because it was so wrong that they were on the ropes like that. And it could happen in an instant. So here's what I would say to all of us in the room who care about making sure that institutions with Christian missions can live those out now and in the future. Um, number one, um, we have an advocacy armed, uh, Vice President Shaprila Maglio is here, who's a Gordon uh, also trustee, and she heads up the advocacy work that we do at the council. And you would think that the ability to hire Christian, which is to your point, if you can't hire Christian faculty, Christian staff, people who are gonna actually do the teaching, how can you maintain your mission? Um, we can't take any of that for granted. And I believe this, God doesn't make mistakes. And so the pressure we're feeling is actually to enable us to get sharper in our presentation, in our story about what we're doing, um, going before uh, Congress and making sure that they understand the value of Christian education. On your way out, you might have uh, noticed this and uh, you can pick it up. It's called The Case for Christian Higher Education. And we didn't have this three years ago. We have it now because we wanna go in and say, this is why Gordon College should not have that kind of improper pressure. Um, but there are things under the First Amendment that are no longer taken for granted. And those of us who are Christians have to educate ourselves. We have to be involved with government. And more than ever, I think we need to encourage our young people, the next generation, to get into government and to be excellent public servants. That's how we're gonna maintain the democracy that we want. Yep. And the back show. Yeah, uh, Joseph Lacondi, Associate Professor of the King's College in New York City. Thank you for a very stimulating discussion. I want to raise a different question that hasn't been raised yet, which I think is a really important one. Uh, 25 years ago, uh, the great church historian Mark Null delivered a talk at Wheaton College called The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. I happened to be in that audience. I was working on my grad degree at Wheaton at the time, and it was a room at least as large as this, maybe twice the size. You could hear a pin drop when Mark Knoll talked about this scandal, this failure to think deeply and Christianly in higher education, that Christians weren't doing the hard work in their own disciplines to challenge the assumptions of their own disciplines. You could hear a pin drop. My question for you guys is, and Mark Knoll was so gracious and ironic in the way he delivered that, that message. I, that's not my personality as an Italian uh, American from Brooklyn. Uh, it's not my, I, I aspire to that, but I'm not there yet. So my somewhat pugnacious question is, you know, do you think we still have this scandal in the Christian mind, the failure to really think deeply and Christianly in our professions, challenging the, the assumptions and the ideals in economics, in politics, in philosophy, in theology, doing real hard level, you know, deep level thinking? I, I, eight years in higher education now, I think the crisis is alive and well. I want to hear from you guys, though. Do you think the crisis persists, number one? Number two, if you do, what do you hope to do about it? Why don't you start with the uh, crisis of the evangelical mind in uh, higher education, and I'll take the crisis of the evangelical mind in things beyond higher education. <laughs> uh, so uh, why don't you go first? Well, one of the things, if I remember Mark's uh, talk, which ended up becoming a, a book uh, which all of us have read, uh, I think one of his opening lines is that the scandal of the evangelical mind is that there is no evangelical mind. And uh, he was really um, offering a prophetic word to the tradition in 1994, and what he observed to be the, the lack of interest within the evangelical church and within the community of being really thoughtful on the pressing cultural issues. One of the good results of, of speaking a prophetic word to the faithful is that he mobilized people in pretty profound ways. And so much so that, uh, you know, a decade later when I was uh, working on Faith in the Halls of Power, I found a lot of examples of where the evangelical mind was alive and well, not just within faith-based institutions like Wheaton College or Gordon College, but also within places like Stanford University and Harvard University. Um, are there challenges? Absolutely. And I think that the dumbing down of our culture, which has happened everywhere, and the evangelical community is certainly a part of that, uh, is, is a challenge that we face. At the same time, Joe, I have to say how impressed I am with the intellectual seriousness I see on my campus every single day. I would actually put the intellectual seriousness of Gordon College students against the intellectual seriousness of Princeton or Rice students that I worked with in previous uh, jobs. 
that there is a sense in which they have deep moral questions and they really want to bring the very best thinking to bear on those questions. My faculty colleagues feel the same way and they're trying to bring that to bear. Now, I think that the challenge is that as we've become a distracted culture, social media has made it where it's very hard to hold people's attention for a book length treatment on anything, sometimes even a chapter length treatment of anything. And so that's been the, the issue that I think that we face, and perhaps Pete might say a couple words about that cultural moment that we live in. But Mark would, you know, Mark and I've talked about it. Mark would say he's much more hopeful and optimistic today than he was in 1994, and I feel the same way, that I think that there has been a rallying cry. We certainly have an, uh, a surge of more thoughtful Christians in more strategic places who are doing better work than we have ever seen before. Um, a, a wonderful professor at Harvard was just uh, recognized, he's a committed evangelical Christian, just recognized for being at the very top of his field. That would have been unthinkable 30 years ago. Not because there weren't Christians there who were serving, but they, had not, they were not committed to bringing their Christian faith to bear on their scholarship in such a public way. So for those kinds of things, I think they're hopeful signs. Pete, are you as optimistic? <laughs> well, I, I, I agree with, with Michael. I actually think that the you know, the scandal of the evangelical mind as it relates to higher education is, is really not the main problem. And, and, um, and I agree with him that we're probably in better shape now than, than we were before. Um, and I think the quality of what's being produced among Christian scholars and professors um, is, is really uh, impressive. Um, so I don't think that that's really the focal point of the danger. Uh, my, my own view uh, is, uh, that the real scandal of the evangelical mind is, um, if I can put on a political hat here, but it's, but it's a political hat which has cultural ramifications, and I think ultimately uh, ramifications that are quite damaging to the Christian witness is in politics. Um, I think that the way that um, evangelicals, a lot of evangelicals, prominent evangelicals, have engaged in, in, in politics in this moment um, has been discrediting, deeply discrediting. Um, and, um, and I want to put a caveat on, the, on, uh, on this, too. Uh, I understand, I'll just name names here in terms of, uh, obviously, Donald Trump is a, is, a, is a factor here. I understand and have very close friends uh, who were evangelical Christians who voted for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton, and I perfectly accepted the argument, that the, or understood the argument that they, that they made, which is you had to weigh the, the policies that these individuals who happen to be conservative philosophy, they felt like that on policy, he would advance in the courts and on pro-life issues the greater good for the country. Um, and, uh, uh, and on the flip side, there were some real downsides to him. Um, that's a perfectly reasonable argument to make. I ultimately didn't agree with it. I didn't vote for either one, but, but I certainly understood it. I think what is happening now is that a lot of prominent evangelicals um, have uh, have turned this politics into a zero-sum game, and the degree to which they are uh, the sword and shield for the president uh, and defending actions, not just going sotto voce on certain things that he's doing, but are outright defending what he's doing and doing ways that I think are so transparently hypocritical to the rest of the world, um, it's doing tremendous amount of damage um, to, the, to the Christian witness. It pains me a great deal as somebody who has, up until this moment, considered myself an evangelical um, Christian. My, my faith commitments haven't changed, but, uh, but, uh, but I think that the, the, the term itself uh, has. And it's been quite discouraging, uh, frankly, because I, I, from my own perspective, that's the only one I guess I can speak from, I, I've just gotten the sense that it is not that people imperfectly are having their faith, you know, we're having our, our, our minds transformed and therefore we are in politics and in different areas of our lives imperfectly trying to conform other areas to our faith. But I think what's happened now is that, uh, is that uh, Christian faith is subordinate to partisan politics and a kind of political tribalism that's more acute in my experience uh, now uh, among evangelical Christians almost than, than even in the wider, um, wider world. Um, and, uh, and I just think that that's really, really problematic. I think to full, so fully be behind a person who embodies, in my estimation, a kind of Nietzschean ethic is just extraordinary. And when 
you have an individual that is acting in ways that transgress so many moral uh, lines, and these leading figures come out and say, we're going to give him a mulligan. Um, and these were the very same people that took a billy club uh, to, to Bill Clinton uh, when the moral transgressions happened. And it turned out that those arguments didn't really actually matter. What mattered is, who's the target here? If it's their guy, we go after him. Morality matters. If it's our guy, you know, it's really, we're, we're, uh, we're electing a president, not a preacher. Um, so that is a problem. Now, in saying that, I, I want to make a couple of qualifications. One is uh, the evangelical movement is a huge movement. It's about 25% of, uh, of the population. Um, and, uh, and as I said, th there's a whole spectrum of evangelicals you know, in terms of their views. But my only, only point here is that a lot of prominent evangelicals uh, are making arguments that are hurting. And as it relates, I will say that this as well to, to higher education and, and what worries me about this in part is, um, is that this has kind of collateral effects um, because you, you burn up goodwill. And so people begin to associate everybody all together and they think this is, so this is what the Christian enterprise is all about. It's all a game, it's all a power, power thing. And so when you need people to come in and try and defend people like uh, Gordon and, 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 and Michael Lindsay, because they're making these, the, uh, be, because they stand for something real and true and good. Um, people just sort of say, you know, f f uh, forget it. So I think the radiating discrediting effects um, are, uh, are, are, are harmful. But other than that, I don't have many opinions uh, on the subject. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so many hands up. We're gonna take two more quick questions and quick responses. Right there. If you could just wait for the mic to come. Do we have a mic coming? You could stand up so it's easier for, to see. Hi, I'm Hannah Wardell. I'm a recent Gordon alumna. Um, and my question is more about um, presentation and optics in some sense. So we as Christian college supporters um, believe in the value of teaching the good life. Um, but what do we do in an economy and in a free market that doesn't necessarily see the value of that? Um, we're competing in this economy of education and we're presenting a product that people necessarily don't want to buy. So how do we present Christian higher education as something that is attractive um, to people who don't necessarily think that they want that? Who wants to take that? I, uh, I'll just uh, briefly say that I think that, that um, what is a Christian, something that Pete has alluded to, that Michael has alluded to, um, we need to make sure that we are outspoken about the breadth of the narrative of the indispensable nature of the hope of Jesus Christ. Um, and I think we need to tell the stories of who Christians are. They are across all fields. They're doing very good things. Um, I think it's an opportunity for us to actually speak clearly and boldly about the, um, uh, the kind of uh, fruits of the spirit kind of work. And that if you want to become a person who embodies the fruits of the spirit, it's going to have to be in a place that values the fruits of the spirit and that values where that came from, which is the word of God. Last question. <laughs> so many, we haven't been over here, so we'll go right over here. Uh, hello, you've talked a little bit about uh, money tonight. I'm wondering what would be uh, maybe your concise response to the argument being advanced now uh, uh, by uh, the economist Brian Kaplan in his book, The Case Against Education, which is making pretty much a, a full assault on a lot of things you've been talking about tonight. <laughs> At root, education's about transformation. It's about helping people to become uh, a better version of themselves, about helping them to go deeper, to develop relationships that make a more meaningful life. And uh, I, I'm not here to defend uh, higher education in general, but I do believe deeply, I'm very committed to the kind of community that occurs uh, at a place like Gordon College. So I'd like to close with this example. Earlier today, we were, uh, a group of Gordon students are here with me, our presidential fellows, and we were touring the, the new Museum of the Bible, which is just a wonderful place. And I ran into a friend, Tim Shaw, who's a political scientist, and uh, he was reminding me of a, a friend that he had who was on our faculty named David Lumstein. David was an international affairs scholar 
who uh, began his career teaching at Yale University, but wanted at the end of his career to serve at a Christian college. And so he came and joined the Gordon faculty. David deeply invested in students and wanted to make a really positive difference in their lives. And he saw uh, higher education was the primary vehicle in which he could help to shape not just one or two lives, but thousands of lives over the course of his career. David would meet with students to talk about their future and their vision and uh, help them to sort of plan what came next. And uh, David was having breakfast with a recent Gordon graduate on a Saturday morning where they were talking about this young man who was thinking about his next job opportunity. It turned out over breakfast, David uh, had a heart attack and, uh, and died. David had never married and didn't have any kids, so his Gordon students were his family. And his brothers lived in Southern California, and they asked if uh, my faculty colleagues would, would go and help pack up his apartment. So they went into his apartment and began going through you know, his belongings, which is a difficult thing to do. As they went into his home office, they found this large stack of manila file folders that had the names of students on them. At first, they thought they might be graded papers that he was holding on to, but it was more students than he taught. And they began to notice that within these file folders, there were little scraps of paper. My brother uh, has a drug addiction. My mom is battling cancer. And as they went through, they began to realize that these were file folders that David was keeping on every single graduating senior. And they were prayer folders that he had made where he could pray for the students by name. At some institutions, you're lucky if your professor knows you by name. But at Gordon College, we pray for you by name. The reason why I have de devoted my life to Gordon and to the vision of Christian higher education is because it's a community that calls us to a better version of ourselves, that's willing to invest in the next generation and is willing to, to pray for a whole cohort of students and none of us even knew he was doing it. It's that kind of a community that makes the kind of schools that we represent really distinctive in a world where we need a lot more of that kind of countercultural Christianity that also advances the common good. Michael, Shirley, Pete, thank you so much. The slightly awkward task now falls to me to ask you to turn your attention from the contemplation of the transformative power of loving prayer to the small invitation on your seat to join the Trinity Forum Society. But we commend this invitation to you. We hope that you will do it. We are so glad that you have joined us tonight. Uh, your membership in the Trinity Forum Society is what makes programs such as this possible. We try to provide that much needed and all too scarce space for leaders to grapple together with about what matters most and an environment that is both intellectually rigorous, civil, and warmly hospitable. We hope that you will join us in that effort. As you might imagine, there are many benefits to joining the Trinity Forum Society. We've talked a great deal about reading this evening. One of the benefits is you receive our quarterly readings where we take one of the best pieces of literature or letters in the Western tradition, add an introduction explaining its context, relevance, background, enduring impact, put discussion questions at the end so it's essentially a book club in a bag, as well as receiving invitations to events like this uh, and our daily what we're reading list of recommended readings. As a special bonus for tonight, uh, if you join this evening, you will have your choice of any free reading of your, uh, your selection. A few ones we recommend include Wendell Berry's The Loss of the University and Dorothy Sayers' The Lost Tools of Learning. You're also part of a larger community that meets together, grapples together with what matters most, and hopefully lights a candle. So we hope that you will join us for future evening conversations. So one of the next ones coming up in Washington, D.C. in this very room on May 7th is one that you will not want to miss. We have not yet sent out invitations, but we'll be doing so in about a month or so. And that is to join us for a conversation between David Brooks and Notre Dame scholar Patrick Deneen looking at whether liberalism has failed. It will be a provocative question and discussion. 
Finally, as we conclude, it is always appropriate to end with thanks, and there are many people to thank tonight. We were delighted and gratified as well as th thankful to work with our partners and our friends, Gordon College, uh, in sponsoring this event with Michael Lindsay and his very able team, as well as a number of benefactors from Gordon who helped make this possible. I'd also like to thank our volunteers, Ashley Winters and Amanda Zeismer, along with interns extraordinaire, Nathaniel Schink and Caleb Luke, our terrific photographer, Clay Blackmore, my Cracker Jack colleagues, Colleen O'Malley, Alyssa Abraham, and Ashley White. And along those lines, I'd like for Colleen and Alyssa and Ashley White just to wave their hands. Uh, if you want to join the Trinity Forum Society, these are the women you should be speaking to. Finally, thank you again to our extraordinarily, extraordinary panelists, Pete Weiner, Shirley Hoogstra, and Michael Lindsay, and to each of you for your presence and your participation this evening. Good night. Mm -hmm.